Hi, w welcome back. Uh, we we were just backstage, <laughs> just having a good chat. Uh, we're you know, learning a new technology. It's actually uh, kind of fun because we get to talk for a bit before we come live uh, to you all. Uh, Giannis, uh, you're at Lloyd Register. Mark, uh, you are at JSK. Uh, thank you both for being here, taking time out of your busy schedules to share your insights and ideas with uh, our community. So without further ado, I'll let you introduce yourselves beyond that and uh, have a chat and I'll join you at the end. That sound good? Super stuff, Val. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, so, Yanis, why don't I go first? Um, so my name is Mark Lawrence. I think I know some of you in the audience, um, but do feel free to to chat, to ask questions. I'm the Global Head of Organization and People Analytics at GlaxoSmithKline, GSK. Uh, and I'm joined here by my good friend, Yanis Nerenzartis. Um, Yanis, did you want to just say a few words? My name is Yanis, and I work as a Global Business Intelligence um, Lead in Lloyd's Register. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I think uh, I've already had some really great um, chats going today around people analytics and um, I, I look forward to explore more our topic on uh, you know what's important for someone that is starting or the skills that they need to have uh, in order to progress in this evolving world. Super stuff, thank you Yana. So um, just to, to give a, a brief abstract of, of where we're going to go today. Um, so We'll cover some of the methods uh, commonly used by people analytics teams, um, as well as uh, the importance of some of the softer skills that uh, both Yanis and I feel quite passionate about. Um, you'll certainly see the passion coming uh, from Yanis as, as he starts uh, getting into, into role, I know. But um, I think um, one of the things that we've noticed um, jointly is the increasing um, shift of technical skills, um, much more in the way of coding, much more in the way of analytical, statistical methodologies. Um, and I think that's gonna really advance uh, people analytics, but, um, but also alongside that, we need to manage it, we need to steward it, we need to make sure that the opportunities are being uh, correctly serviced uh, for the correct, level of value to be impactful to the business. Um, so Yanis, why don't we start with uh, a little bit of a, a chat about, uh, about um, uh, technology. Um, as the business intelligence lead at, at Lloyd's Register, what kinds of um, technologies are you seeing that are important today and, and maybe things that might be becoming more important in the future? Thanks, Mark. So, Initially, when we think about people analytics and from the whole, let's say, maturity scale, when people start from the very basics, we see the needs of just using simple tools like Excel, where I would say most of the people start from, um, into gradually growing and going into a more sustainable way of thinking, more automated reporting, more advanced techniques. I see a lot of people then making the next step into BI, business intelligence, and utilizing other tools like, we've seen millions of tools like you know, Power BI, Tableau, ClickView, all, all sorts of tools out there for people to use where we can enable efficient reporting and efficient um, analysis, um, not only just for us, for the people that they are analyzing the information, but also efficient in the way they can be used from the stakeholders. Um, to make it always relevant and accurate. Um, but the last few years, and again, I, I appreciate that there's not necessarily everyone uh, performing this advanced analytics, doing predictive methods, but something that I definitely think it should be in the radar of everyone in this space should be the more advanced statistical uh, skills or coding skills that they are emerging to perform predictive analytics. This would include, let's say, statistical packages such as SPSS, which many of you will probably avoid. Um, it is used mainly for social science. Um, but at the same time, we see programming languages coming into uh, people analytics uh, using R or Python being amongst the most popular ones. Um, you can do some amazing things um, using these, uh, these tools to enable 
effective uh, and informed decision making in your business. However, the one point I'd like to stress is that you wouldn't necessarily need all of those to start. You can take baby steps initially and kind of take a step at a time until you reach the advanced. Not We don't necessarily need to get directly to the advanced predictive using coding. Otherwise, it might seem quite a big challenge at a very short space of time. Um, what's your thoughts, Mark, on that? Yeah, I think I'm reminded of uh, when we first met and, uh, and some of the discussions that we had uh, a few years ago about um, needing to identify the right opportunity to then develop. Um, and so at that point, I think we were talking about call center effectiveness, and, and that's probably an area which some of our audience have, have looked at before. But, you know, we don't necessarily need to fly into flying. We need to actually understand, firstly, what it is we're trying to solve for, and then choose the appropriate data set, choose the appropriate technology, choose the appropriate language uh, to be able to answer that question. Um, so at that point, I think, um, you know, we can probably think about a maturity scale for different um, ways of, of approaching technology. A software that's within reach of most people, things like Microsoft Excel. Um, we might then think about how we um, work that into something of a more advanced model. And, you know, using statistical packages like SPSS um, or SAS um, are the kinds of tools which some people might encounter at university if they're doing a particularly quantitative discipline. Um, and then from there, getting into the coding things like R and, and Python. Um, I think what, what I've found emerging um, in my leadership space is actually trying to prioritize some of those skills. So, you know, if I have um, uh, one hiring ticket and I know that I wanted to get somebody who has that kind of a coding uh, uh, skill and capability, would I prioritize R? Or Python? Would I expect one person to be doing both? What's your experience of that? I would say, in the really, um, really good summary there of of how you actually start from some basics and then you can develop further. Um, I would say that for someone to start and uh, in a relatively new function of uh, HR or people analytics, you definitely don't need Python or R. To, to for the beginning of their journey. And even until you get to a more strategic level, um, you can achieve some great things with basic reporting. Now, of course, you want to get more advanced and do these more predictive methods and, um, and look uh, into prescriptive actions, uh, which are informed based on the situation and your predictions. I would say, R is more of, of a tool, of a more statistical analysis tool, uh, which again has a huge capacity to do uh, all sorts of analysis. Uh, Python is a more of a, a, of a programming language that basically can do anything possible. Um, I'm a fan of R just uh, as a statistician personally, uh, but I would definitely say no, the tools are there and they are available, but in order not to scare any uh, ambitious HR professional that have never seen that much of data before or uh, much of, you know, uh, lots of codes uh, and uh, complex, uh, uh, you know, writing of codes, uh, you don't necessarily need them to start. Um, what, what is really important, one of the key skills in the approaches um, I've seen that have, have really worked here, as Mark mentioned earlier, is how do you approach the problem? What is the problem you're uh, looking to solve? What's the question you're trying to answer? Um, and these are some of the key questions that we really need to set at the start before we even think about the technology, before we even think about uh, you know, what, what we're doing, how we're doing it. It's about what's the problem? And then do we have the data? In what uh, format are the data? Can we use them? Are they accurate? Can we understand them? Do other people understand them? Um, I think, and, and this really shifts us a little bit more on the approach rather than 
the tools we will actually use to perform our analysis and develop our function. Um, what, what are your thoughts, Matt, Mark, on uh, on the approach of um, and how the approach is evolving actually through the years and the, the current challenges? Absolutely, I, I think um, for those of us that um, that have been around in, in people analytics for a while. Um, we probably all recognize the application of the scientific method. Um, the um, need to firstly really truly understand the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, now, I think uh, from there we can, we can obviously start to hypothesize. What are the things that we think are driving that problem? Can we get the data to start to prove and disprove that problem? Um, and of course, that getting the data piece can be so painful. Right. And it's one of those things that, um, you know, often our our sponsors uh, struggle to understand, you know, when they think, right, you just drop it into a spreadsheet and we'll have an answer by tomorrow. Actually, when we start to work through the fact that maybe we want to join together our own HR data with um, CRM data, with operations data, with real estate data and actually trying to mobilize each of those functions to provide the data, to put it into a format that's easily shareable, uh, to integrate those data sets, to find the appropriate uh, unit of measure at which to join those data sets. Um, that can be, you know, months of work. And then moving from there on to the analysis, right? I think the, the critical step here, which is often overlooked in people analytics functions, is having professionals who are skilled at designing those research projects, um, skilled at understanding how we join the, together these disparate data step, sets, how we actually want to analyze those to ensure that we are staying relevant and true to that business problem. If we do all that and we get all that right, then actually re reading out uh, to the business, keeping our sponsors engaged throughout that process, um, that should all be relatively easy. But of course, most of us know that as time goes on, businesses are shifting and priorities are shifting. And so it can be super difficult to keep stakeholders engaged in a really long drawn out project. So one of the ways that we get around that is to not only keep our eye on that end goal, which is the really, really high value outcome, but on the journey, we have to drip feed insights. We have to keep people learning. We have to keep people interested in what it is that we're doing um, so that we maintain that sponsorship. Only by having a strong sponsor at the end will we really drive change. Um, so that I think is, is the basic methodology. But of course, in order to do that, we can't all be data scientists. Thank goodness, because you, you know, Yanis, I'm far from a data scientist, but um, I think the um, the key to it is we need other supporting roles to make these projects a success. We need project managers, we need change managers, we need consulting skills, research design, as I mentioned. Um, so, have you have you come across any teams where you see all of that working in harmony? Uh, yes, um, absolutely, and uh, I think. This is more in the area of analytics of, uh, you know, the more advanced, let's say, where we do a more of a project base, we have a problem, we define it. And I think this is what is the most valuable part, apart from, you know, all the regular reporting that uh, many of the businesses have to start with. Um, and um, I, I remember um, one of the uh, cases last year, uh, we worked um, in the business where we kind of brought people from various parts of the world and also different functions and areas um, to, at the time the project was about um, the amount of time our people uh, you need to travel. Um, and this was a really good example of how we brought HR professionals, uh, people from the operations, people from the planning teams, uh, and uh, people that they are, let's say, our data people, to put together a mechanism of, of being able to um, measure and understand the amount of time people spend traveling. The focus at the time was for um, from a well-being perspective. 
but as you said, during this project, we ended up in a really successful way uh, because it was also related, of course, the, uh, in some countries, the, the compliance issues, are, the compliance rules are really strict. Uh, so it ended up really successfully. And I think one of the, the key success criteria I would uh, um, personally um, value is the diverse people we've got and their diverse skill set. So we had we had the right people to manage the project and ensure everyone is informed and everyone is uh, on track. Uh, but at the same time, you had the technical experts, either the technical experts to do the analysis or the technical experts that would really understand and interpret uh, the problem. So I definitely believe that this requires a lot of skills to be gathered together from a group of people rather than just, you know, data analysts or just an HR professional. I think it's really this blended, when you blend these different skills where you utilize the expertise of a data scientist um, and at the same time you inform it with the knowledge and understanding and interpretation of a person that understands people, understand the particular issue you're trying to solve, and I think this is really the kind of secret of success that will give you a, an output that uh, will be usable uh, to the business. And then a relevant action can be taken because in many of these cases, we see lots of work, lots of effort and resources being used for a great analysis being there, but then nothing happening with it. So... I think another focus is when we're designing what we're designing to keep in mind, okay, say I create this analysis and this will be the output. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to use it in this scenario? And how are you going to use it in this other scenario? Uh, thinking with the end in mind and really preparing the business for the change or for the action that we need to take in, in various different situations. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, that stakeholder management piece, right, is is so important. But the um, the main output of that stakeholder management is action, right? And I think many organisations have stakeholders who are interested and want to see what happens if they pose a problem. Very few who actually have the courage um, and the conviction to be able to act on um on the insights that are provided so partly that is a trust issue um and there is a need for people analytics to build credibility um and i've certainly seen that firsthand you know where we've done some incredible analytics um and then gone to the business and found that uh actually the business says well do you know you're not really telling us anything we don't know actually we are telling them stuff they don't know they're just not quite landing and so we, I think that's where the importance of the change management uh, aspect of people analytics comes in to help drive uh, the appropriate understanding and then hold those leaders to account to, to really drive the change. Um, I'm just going to pause for a moment and, and have a quick look at the, uh, the chat and the questions coming in. Um, I can see uh, Tim uh, from Philip Morris. Hey, Tim. Good to good to see you here. Um, says. Um, you know, do we think there's a need for front end applications uh, to do with, um, you know, querying and analysis to do with uh, data visualization? Um, hey, Mark, you broke up a little bit, but I think we're just addressing the first question from Tim. Right. Um, yeah. So. Absolutely, and I think this is one of the most important parts of, of, uh, of delivering a project. Uh, when I did my degree in statistics, uh, one of the simple outputs that you know, I remember of, of what I do as a statistician is getting a very simple uh, problem that somebody can explain to me. Then I translated everything based on the data I've got or the, or the methods I'm going to use to something then do my analysis, do my work, and then again having to translate this something that not many people understand with very simple words that anybody that's not a statistician that has no knowledge of complex methods to what does it mean for them. And I think this is really the key point you're mentioning here, Tim, and I couldn't agree more. Yes, it is definitely critical. 
the delivery of the message, I would say, and that's what the visualization uh, is needed for. Now, personally, I've used extensively, and I know in a lot we've used it, uh, one of the uh, softwares we use is Power BI, uh, but as we said, there are loads out there. Yes, it is very important. However, uh, I just want to stress that, you know, with R, you can do amazing things to visualize data. And, you know, many people think that it's just a coding language, um, but believe me, you can do ggplot, just look a little bit around that, and you can do some amazing things uh, with R. And I'll give you an example of what we did a few years ago in a previous meeting I was um, with R. We were uh, working on um, actually regular reporting, monthly reporting, quarterly reporting for the HR function, reporting on you know recruitment, um, absence, sickness, annual leave, people's overtime, number of people, headcounts, all this together. And because we had different functions, what we wanted to achieve is something visual um, that at the same time is efficient and automated. So we created once the analysis and then I cooperated with another data science and um, uh, we managed to get from our uh, ready-made presentations, PowerPoint presentations, directed to center, cent, cent, certain people based on their part of the business. So every month, instantly, you would get three or four PowerPoint presentations ready-made. Which one would be for this area? The other one would be for this area, and so on. So. I think that's in relation to your question about the tools for visualization, but I wouldn't stand only on the technical spe uh, on the technical aspect. What really matters is to think simple and think the way the user perceives this information when you're building these visualizations um, and the, you know the story you're gonna want to tell rather than okay, let me just make something up a nice, pretty, fancy dashboard. What's your experience on that, Mark? Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, many analytics purists would say that, you know, a dashboard um, it shouldn't be, um, you know, the, the expected outcome. Um, I think many people who don't understand much about analytics assume that's what the outcome will be. So there is a disconnect to manage there. Um, I'm reminded of a quote by uh, Mike West, formerly at Google, who said, um, you know, Dashboards may not be our best analytic work, but they are useful nonetheless. And the reason they're useful is because they drive engagement in what we do. Um, so we put something in the hands of a sponsor or a stakeholder. We invite them to start participating with data. And hopefully they can find some aspects of that useful for decision making and action. And those bits which don't quite uh, give them the information they need, provide clues for us to, to investigate more deeply. So, um, so I think they can be useful as a door opener to more advanced analytical work. Um, in terms of products, of course, we have to remain agnostic when we're talking in a, in a public environment, but I definitely see pros and cons to different, to different tools. I think as, a, as an informed buyer of those kinds of products, I would consider you know, really what the um, objective is for self-service, whether or not it needs to be a query tool, whether it needs to be a visualization tool, um, because you'll probably find that the criteria will be slightly different. I'm mindful we have only a couple of minutes left, and I want to turn the attention now to a couple of questions from Elise. Um, so Elise, thank you for this. She, she asks, is there currently capacity and propensity for organizations to actually invest in a people analytics person? Or are you seeing companies tending to do more outsourcing and consulting? Um, for me personally, I think absolutely a mix. And, um, and I think it probably goes hand in hand with the size of the organization and the budgets which are potentially available. Um, but uh, before I go into that in more depth, Yanis, a quick reaction on that? Yeah, I would say um, you probably have all sorts of different situations depending on the on, on, on the on the business. However, what I want to stress is that this time, given the current situation that is going on, probably people analytics is more relevant than ever to be applied. And I'm saying that because of the different way 
that our, our life, of course, and our, our working environment has changed. Uh, the future ways of working, we see them completely different. Um, and elements that were previously very easily identified, such as, okay, how engaged I see an employee in the office, or how much people collaborate between them because I see lots of movement and everything. Now they are just not visible. So things such as um, um, uh, network, uh, network analysis, organization, ONS, organizational network analysis, to get a really deep understanding of how is the people of the firm, our employees, how are they working together? Are they collaborating during this huge change that I don't, I, I cannot recall like another such a, a, a radical change um, in, in, um, in my employment and even in the previous year. So I would say it's most relevant than ever and that I believe that people will actually start investing a lot more in people analytics uh, because people are our greatest assets uh, in, in business. Fantastic. And then um, some of the job roles which, uh, which might be influencing that recruitment effort um, just to finalize Elise's question there, I think, um, you know, you could look at anything from analyst, data scientist, um, you know, you might see statistician or you might see, um, you know, uh, even um, a, a, a problem with taxonomy in this area is that some people would refer to it as HR analytics, some people people analytics, workforce analytics, relationship analytics. You know, the list goes on. And I think um, this is part of the opportunity that we have designing this uh, discipline for the future is really nailing down what we mean by some of those things. But those jobs are definitely out there. Maybe not so many under the current COVID environment, but they're definitely there, Elise. I can see Al's joined us now. Al, you've got some interesting reflections. <laughs> well, uh, first off, I just have such a great appreciation for both of you and the questions that you're asking one another as well as your responses and just to highlight a couple of key points and i think it's uh really underappreciated not only by us doing the work but by those consuming the work and is that is that we cannot in my view my own language take uh, a data centric approach or a tool centric approach. We have to really understand the needs of the business. You talked about, for lack of a better term, drip marketing, you know, your stakeholders to let them know that progress is being made, but really understanding the, the scope of organizational change and the scope of the uh, work required to aggregate data from disparate data sets, package it analyze it, communicate it, you know, that doesn't happen with a snap of a finger. And I think you all both highlighted that, you know, really well. I mean, I have so many questions, but I also uh, realize we're, we're running up on time. So my, where I'd like to, to leave this is how can uh, listeners, visitors learn more about not only you two individually, but how would you advise people to educate themselves on the nature of this work and how they can get better at it? It's a great question. Yanis, you want to go first or second? I'm happy. I'm happy to go first, Mark. Thank you. Uh, I would say, um, that, and, and it's one. it was one of my personal challenges uh, when I was starting in this area, I would say there's a lot of theory out there. There is a lot of articles. There is a lot of um, examples. For me, as a more practical person, I would really encourage everyone to go and try. Instead of reading 10 possible examples of how to do things, read one and try to do it yourself. And then not only just do it, not only just follow um, you know, the certain models or approaches that are already out there, make it relevant to your needs, make it relevant to the challenges of your organization. And I think that is the key that will drive your own journey um, and your learning path, because your learning depends on what is relevant for you, your organizational needs, and what uh, what skills you need in order to develop uh, um, in a in a targeted way, not just I'm going around to learn about people analytics in general. I think that's one of my core points and challenges I experienced as I started. Um, Mark, would like to add something on 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 this area? 
Well, Yanis, uh, I'm in awe of you and your development over the last few years, as, as you know. But um, uh, so I think people could do a lot worse than to listen to your advice there. But for me personally, my um, my career evolved and meandered for many years through, you know, basic business analysis uh, into something which became a little bit more focused and a little bit more targeted. So started to talk with customers. And so I think touching on your point, Yanis, about making sure that we stay true to the business objective, making sure that we stay relevant to that, I think is a great way to, to be start experimenting. But on the kind of external uh, side, I think, you know, there are some great books um, and a lot of content shared socially uh, in places like LinkedIn and Twitter. But Al, I mean, conferences and, and you know, bringing together communities like this, I think is so valuable. Uh, so I really want to thank you for, for everything that you do in this space, um, because I think, you know, this is going to be uh, a treasure trove of information, not just for early stage practitioners, but for, for those who are a little bit more advanced and still learning and, and chatting with each other. For me personally, I talk with a lot of my peers uh, on a regular basis, and we quite openly exchange the kinds of things that we're working on because it's such a young discipline, we're not yet competing. And I think that's uh, that's a great way to accelerate. Yeah, well, Mark, uh, thank you for the kind words. Thank you for your contributions to the community over the years. Super appreciate you. Giannis, pleasure uh, meeting you. And I love that someone with a statistics background actually chose our profession. So thank you for, for making the leap. I, I hope you're not uh, going crazy. I, I hope you didn't lose a bet. <laughs> but it sounds like you're enjoying it and obviously making a positive impact. So thank you both for being here. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, be well. All right, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with Eric Knudsen of Glint.